Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're glad to see that you made it. So I'm Randy with True IT. I do business development for True IT, manage events. Uh, I'm kind of the front line for uh, most uh, sales and new client communication. Uh, Wes Henry will be doing uh, the primary presentation. He's brilliant. He's our uh, CIO president and owner of uh, True IT. Um, I have a lot of questions myself personally about M365 and what it is beyond just Office 365. You know, like what is this Windows Forever about? Uh, what, what are these advanced security features? And uh, exactly how do you use the virtual desktop effectively with all these tools that it comes with? So uh, with that, uh, here's uh, Wes Henry. Thank you very much, Randy. Welcome, everyone. We appreciate you joining us today. We want to make this as informative and um, useful, valuable information to you as possible. So during this, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, speak up. We try, we'll do our best to try to fit your questions into the presentation. Uh, we just ask that if you're not asking a question, that if you would stay uh, muted on your end, just to keep background noise to a minimum, we'd sure appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, so with that, I'm going to just uh, play a couple more slides here as we talk through a, a little bit of introductory material, and then we're going to start off with a um, kind of from the basics and uh, some very simple things and get kind of a high level overview of M365, and then we'll start diving into the various pieces from there. The purpose of our workshop here, um, obviously, it is an introduction to Microsoft 365, and we're going to talk about some of the various editions of Microsoft 365, how they compare to Office 365. Microsoft isn't great at their naming, and so um, it, it's often a little confusing as to what exactly they are, you know, what's included in what and what they mean and why they're named the way that they're named. Obviously, we want to talk about the benefits and the capabilities of Microsoft 365, and then, of course, we'll talk about some next steps and where you might want to go from here. So my name is Wes Henry. I am the president and the CIO of True IT. Uh, I've been one of the founding members of, of True IT since our company started, and I'm very interested in technology. I am very much a tech, um, I don't know if you want to call me a nerd or a geek, um, but I've been involved in technology for the past uh, 35 years, going on 40 years actually. Um, everything from uh, self-taught programmer to um, learning networking to becoming a tech to being a software developer to having my own uh, IT company and uh, that gets us to where we are today. So always been interested in this and I, I love the capabilities of technology and I love the ability to connect things together, um, networking and um, automation and things like that. So, you know, what is the driver Microsoft 365? Um, there's a few of them and this isn't a brand new thing. This has been coming for a while. Um, it's part of the transition to the cloud. There's a there's a major cloud element to Office 365, which is a big part of Microsoft 365. So there's a major cloud element to all of this too. Um, but really this is more relevant than ever because of things like we just are going through here with the pandemic. So, you know, there's a lot of things that change people moving to work remotely, for example, um, being able to facilitate business when we're not face to face. And a lot of those changes aren't gonna go away. So there's definitely going to be a permanent um, you know, permanent impact on business. But yet people remain the driving force behind all of our, you know, technology, all of our progress. Um, and definitely people are the driving force for everything from small and mid-sized companies up to enterprise companies. Um, so some of the changes that, that are, you know, inherent um, with business, but also especially related to the current environment that we're at, both, um, you know, uh, with the pandemic, but also just economically, um, is we need to be able to get work done. We need to be able to collaborate in real time, um, work virtually, work from anywhere, work remote, for example, um, and facilitate that in a way that's still efficient and that's still effective and that still maintains our company culture um, and, and the relationships with our team members. Um, and again, we'll look at how Microsoft 365 plays into that. 
Cybersecurity is another huge uh, aspect of what we need to deal with in IT and in technology and in business today, right? So the risks of cyber attacks and phishing and ransomware are increasing. The threats are growing uh, exponentially, actually. And so there's more and more of these kinds of attacks being launched every day. Um, where there's some things making the news right now today in terms of uh, cyber attacks, for example. And, you know, that, those kind of things could spread to our country. And cyber attacks are not the way that we used to think about them, where they're targeted, where there's people who are making a decision uh, on every attack and saying, well, I'm going to attack this bank or I'm going to attack this government or, you know, this power station or something like that. Um, they're increasingly automated. And so they are going and they're just the, these programs, these automated attacks are going after anything and everything and everyone. Um, and so we can't rely on saying, well, we're under the radar, we're a small business or, or we're not in a, a primary, you know, high risk sector um, and, and think that that's what's going to keep us secure anymore because that's just not the case. And the security landscape has has increased, in fact, to this to, in the sense that the more that we enable like remote workers, for example, now the devices that they use and the environments that they're in become part of the security scope of the business of the organization. So if they are working remotely and their um, home computer, for example, is vulnerable or gets attacked or gets compromised, that potentially could spread into the organization. Um, and it's not even just necessarily a device. They may go work somewhere remote, a library, a coffee shop, a hotel, um, and those networks have some kind of compromise that, again, because of the fact that they're working remote and they're accessing company information and company data, now they become a security risk to that company information and that company data. And of course, there's always increasing demands to do more for less money, right? So cost is definitely a factor in this. And there's a definite cost to using tools that are not integrated, that are not streamlined, that don't work well together. Um, it, there's a definite cost in losing collaboration among our team members when they aren't able to work, uh, you know, close together like they were pre-pandemic, for example. Um, and so how do we maintain that ability to work efficiently, work effectively? How do we increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our workforce all while reducing the cost in the process? So these are some of the challenges that uh, IT is facing today and businesses are facing today and some of the challenges that we're going to talk about here in terms of Microsoft 365. So I won't go into all the details on here, but um, you can see some of the stats there are pretty big. 88% of small to medium sized businesses feel that they are vulnerable to attacks. They just, they don't feel that they're up to the security necessary to protect themselves, for example. Um, and I would say that that's often very true. It's not easy for a smaller mid-sized business to have the kind of technology resources and security uh, tools, um, protections, practices, and so on in place uh, that an enterprise has, for example. So how does Microsoft 365 uh, relate to some of these things? Um, so you can see what's on the screen here. Again, I won't read all of these, um, but a big part of it is the real-time collaboration piece, um, the security, the technology kind of aspects of it, uh, and the fact that it's an integrated platform, so it's easier to do this. It's uh, all in one place. It's easier to collaborate. It's easier to use the tools that we and our staff are familiar with. Um, we don't have to go out and learn something entirely new. And we can take what we've learned now and migrate that to our increasingly mobile lifestyle or mobile work style, for example, on our devices and in mobile locations. So Microsoft sums it up this way. Microsoft 365 is a secure, cost-effective, and reliable cloud solution for real-time collaboration and secure work from virtually anywhere. And we'll talk more about the specific applications that are in there as well. Um, so just a quick look, uh, the plans that we're going to cover. So Microsoft's licensing um, is, is very uh, complex because they want to enable everybody to be able to get exactly the types of services and products that they need. Um, they do package them up and, and we'll look at some of these package plans, but it's also possible to buy a lot of these services in an a la carte fashion. Um, we can buy a specific plan and then we can add on other additional services and so on. And so if we looked at all of the various licenses that are available and the entire uh, matrix of licensing available, um, it, that would be overwhelming for us and it would definitely eat up way more time than we have for this uh, webinar here. Plus it, you know, it wouldn't really be all that useful for us as well. So we're gonna focus in a few areas here. We're gonna look for example at how um, their Microsoft actually makes some of this available in a free format. 
Um, then there's also personal and family plans, and then the 365 business, and then the M365 enterprise, and then there's still Office 365 enterprise plans available today too. So those are the ones that we're going to focus in on. Be aware though that there are many more than just these available. These are some of the most common, um, and that's why we want to focus in on those uh, in this webinar. Wes, can we take a so, moment to dispel some misconceptions about M365? We sure can. So here's when in talking to people, because I talked to a lot of different organizations around the US and I had one of them uh, say to me when I asked them about uh, what do you know about uh, M365? And they said, oh, you mean the rebranding of Office 365? And I was like, well, no, it's it's a lot more than just Office 365. Office 365 is part of it uh but uh so if you want can you feel that because i know a lot of people uh they don't understand what exactly is going on there i sure can um let me switch back to this previous slide here too and um <clears throat> so microsoft definitely as i mentioned earlier they definitely make it uh more difficult than i think it has to be in terms of uh their naming their product branding and so on and they did rebrand some products to be microsoft 365 that were formerly office 365 but there are still m365 products available um, specifically in the enterprise area and we'll definitely look at those so so yes to some degree there is there was a rebranding of office 365 to microsoft 365 but there is still today a microsoft 365 enterprise um, that is you know very very different than just office 365 it includes a lot more um, randy early on you had uh, asked about windows forever for example that's a part of m365 that's not part of the Office, formerly Office 365 licenses that got rebranded to Microsoft 365. So that's a really good question, really good point. Um, and, and obviously, um, I'll try to address that more as we go along. But if people have questions, remember, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak up and we'll try to dig in deeper in any of those areas where we can. I am going to uh, stop with the slideshow here and I'm going to switch over. Um, for this, I have a couple things that um, I can demo. And uh, to do that demo, I'm going to be using a virtual computer that's in the cloud. And actually, why don't I close that and I'll show you. So what I'm using is a thing that's called Windows 365, which is not part of Office 365 or M365, although there is a, a related piece, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but this is very similar. This is just a virtual Windows computer, but happens to be in the cloud, in Microsoft's cloud. Um, so, and it's called Windows 365. So this is a subscription-based access to a Windows computer in the cloud. So that's what I'm using for this, um, for the live part of the demo here that we'll do. And uh, this is really neat. Uh, it's very handy because I can use this not only from my regular desktop computer, but I can actually access this from my iPad, for example. Um, so, or a computer that's not my work computer. And there's even a web interface to access this as well. All right, we'll give this a second here to finish loading. <clears throat> so yeah, on, so this is the uh, the remote uh, desktop feature. Is, is that what it is, Wes, that we're about? The, yep, so this is Windows or 365. The, vir the virtual um, desktop. A, yep, a, a separate piece. Um, this is separate from Microsoft 365 or Office 365, um, but it is, it's very handy for this demo. Um, and in addition, <clears throat> uh, there is a piece of Office, or excuse me, of Microsoft 365 Business Premium that this is related to. So when we get to that, it, it helps if we've kind of seen how this virtual uh, piece works here. All right, one second here. So oh, is, is, is this the piece that I can log into like from just my normal smartphone and have the uh, computing capacity of a full desktop computer? It is. That's a great question. So yeah, because yeah, so, I um, actually, I talked to some people about this. Um, so you have like uh, your architectural engineers who have like massive blueprints and um, and then you have like people who render like huge video files. They need very powerful computers to to uh, do this stuff and they could literally do it from a smartphone because all the processing power is in the cloud that's correct yep you are correct 
Um, and there are different plans. So obviously for organizations that need that kind of power, they can put that in the cloud. Um, but you may just have regular, um, you know, traditional business use knowledge workers who don't necessarily need a high powered computer in the cloud. There's still benefits of them being able to have that as well. Um, for like you said, for example, they can access it from any device. So I'm able to use uh, my uh, Windows 365 desktop that you just saw. Um, I'm able to use that from an iPad, for example. So if I don't want to carry a laptop around with me, um, I just simply carry my iPad. And if I needed to get access to my work files or uh, work, you know, uh, SharePoint teams, any of those pieces, I can still do it through the iPad. I get a virtual desktop, just like what it, what it looked like on the screen here for us. I see the same kind of thing through my iPad. So it's really handy that way. It's very neat. Okay, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen here and we will take a look at that virtual desktop again. So what you're seeing now is the virtual desktop. And uh, so like Randy and I were just talking about, this is a desktop that's in the cloud. So I just want to show you some, some really simple things. So starting off first, I mentioned that there is a uh, free plan. So anybody who doesn't have this already, um, I know this is kind of strays a little bit from business, but I just want to show you how all this stuff uh, connects and how nice Microsoft has some of these things aligned. Uh, Microsoft has a uh, product that's called Outlook.com. So it's a web email. It's a free email, like a lot of people think of as Gmail is a free email, or um, many people had a Hotmail email address back in the day, or when Yahoo was big, you know, Yahoo had their Yahoo mail and so on. So it's the same kind of thing. So if we go to Outlook.com, there is a way from Outlook.com um, that we can... Um, create, try, so we can set up for a free, oh, this is showing me Outlook for Business. Why is it not cooperating? One of the challenges of live, there we go. One of the challenges of live demos. Uh, so here, if you go to Outlook.com, uh, you see right at the top, there's an option to create a free account. So it, it's literally free. It's It's been free for years. It will remain free for a long, long time, forever probably. And from that, um, you're able to get a free webmail. So you might say to yourself, well, why would I care about a free webmail? Well, not only is it a free email account, but it includes access to these web versions of Microsoft's popular applications. So if you'll see here on the left-hand navigation, there's uh, Microsoft To Do, but there's also Word and Excel and PowerPoint over here, along with OneNote and even Teams. So with a free account, I have access to the most popular Office applications, um, you know, today on the planet. Um, and I can create a new document here. And I'm editing this all in a web. So I don't even have to have the software installed. So this is the idea of the Office web apps. And we'll see that these are part of the Office 365, M365, and Microsoft 365 business plans. Um, but right, you know, right here, I can create a Create a new document, and you know within this document I can do things like apply bold and change my font and change the size, all the things that you'd expect to be able to do in a Word document. And in the background, this is actually creating uh, a, a Microsoft Word document that you could share with anybody else that has Microsoft Word. So you could create a document this way, um, use it for school, use it for home. Uh, use it for work. If you emailed it to someone or shared it with someone else, they would not know that you built this document through the web versus through the desktop application. Wes, what if somebody doesn't have uh, have Word on their computer, but they need to open up a Word file? Can they can they use the free app, web app, to open they up those? They absolutely can. They can. Let me show you one other thing, and we'll circle back to that. That's a great question. Uh, in addition to the Outlook, uh, free Outlook email and free access to these apps, um, you get access to Microsoft's free cloud storage uh, using their tool called OneDrive. So OneDrive is a cloud file storage. Uh, again, Google has something similar to this. If you're familiar with uh, Dropbox, you know it's kind of a similar idea to that as well. Um, you can sync this onto your mobile devices as well, and then files that you put in here will show up on your mobile devices. You can use it to back up your photos to the cloud into your OneDrive right off. 
off of your cell phone, things like that too. So it's very, very cool. So if I, for example, were to use this tool, and let's say I go in here, I'm going to make this so that we can see. So right now, if we look in here, um, in this OneDrive, you'll see that there's no files there, but it's telling me that I can go ahead and drag some files in. So if I were to take a file, for example, and I want to drag this, this is just a regular Microsoft Word document. I'm dragging it in from a folder off my desktop. If I drag that in there, you'll see that it's working on, it's uploading that file. And now with that same free account, I can go in and I can edit that file. So here I am editing a Microsoft Word file. And I'm editing this in a web browser, but yet that file started out as a Microsoft Word document that was not created in the web. It was created with the actual desktop version of Microsoft Word. So to answer, go, circling back to your question, Randy, um, all I did was take a that Microsoft Word document that I could have received anyway from you know someone else that who created it, for example, and I put it in my OneDrive, and from that I was able to use the uh, the web app version of Microsoft Word and edit that document. So this is this is very very cool. Um, it's free email, it's free Word, it's free Excel, it's free PowerPoint, and um, it's free OneNote here as well. Um, and, and so anybody who doesn't have this should re should really be encouraged to have this. Um, and why wouldn't you want to work with the, again, Microsoft Office documents, the most common, the most popular uh, Office file formats uh, available today. So minimize that for a second. We'll switch back here. <clears throat> so that's our uh, free plan. And that's, we... that's new with M365. That used to you used to not have access to the, this, these things unless you paid for Office 365. Um, you could get a free Outlook account and you could get a free OneDrive account, um, but it, they didn't always include the free web apps. That's correct. Okay. Okay, so that's the free plans, and then let's take a look at now the first personal and family plans here too. So we'll just take a brief look at these. So if you want something more than that, you want more than just the free plans, um, they do have the option here for these personal and these family plans. So, um, oops, hold on one second, sorry. So if we jump over here and take a look at those, So they have um, the personal edition is $70 per year. The family edition is 99, 99 a year, so $100. Main difference here is that this is for one person, um, whereas this is for up to six people. And um, otherwise, other than that, they're very, very similar. You can see the applications that they include. So this includes the applications on your desktop or laptop or tablet or phone. Um, and obviously all of these applications are compatible with Windows, Mac, and Android. Um, or iPhone as well, iPad. Um, so this is a really neat way to again have access to these things from home. Um, you know, why would you do? Why would you pay for this, for example, versus having the free version? Well, the reason that you might pay for these versus the free version is that they include the actual applications. Um, so if you're more comfortable um, working with those, um, or you know, need them for some specific functionality that may not be available in the web, because there is still some things that the web versions don't do. Um, you get access to the actual applications and you can install them on your devices. Uh, another reason is that you get additional storage. So with these plans, you get up to one terabyte of storage. I don't remember what you get for the free plans, but I know that it's um, significantly less than that. So um, so those are available too. Okay, so next we'll talk about the... Um, We'll talk about these plans um, for business and the the plans for business, um, the ones that we're going to talk about here is basic, standard, and premium. And know that there are more than these. Um, like I said, Microsoft has a lot of different <coughs> licensing plans available. Um, basic is the access to the cloud services. Standard is the cloud services, so the cloud apps that we looked at before, um, but also these desktop applications. 
Um, so it includes an email account, it includes Teams, it includes the same OneDrive that we looked at, but a business version of OneDrive. Um, it includes you know, Outlook for email, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and then it includes Publisher and Access for the Windows versions only. Um, it does not include Mac versions of those. Um, so that's a really common one, and that's um, very popular. Um, the next level up from that is Business Premium, which includes everything that Standard does, and then it also includes a few of these extra features here. So it includes uh, Intune, it includes Azure Information Protection, uh, Defender, uh, Conditional Access, which um, is actually part of some of the other tools, the Azure Virtual Desktop. Um, and that Azure Virtual Desktop is very similar to that Windows 365 Virtual Desktop that I showed you before. So um, that's what's included in those. We'll just take a quick look here at the pricing that's included with those. Wes, does this include the price hikes that are happening uh, next week? Is this the new price? It pricing? does not. So that's right. That's a great question. This is the legacy pricing still on their website. Um, the, these prices are subject to an increase here coming up in March. Um, so that's a really good point. Uh, it, so Microsoft has uh, an initiative that they refer to as new commerce experience. Um, and new commerce experience is a, a different way to purchase the licensing of these products from Microsoft. Um, they will be having month to month plans where you can you can um, obviously just pay per month and um, the pricing goes up and down depending on how many licenses that you want to buy. They also have plans that are uh, an annual commitment that you can pay monthly, but but you're required to keep that subscription for the whole month. You can increase it, but you can't reduce it. And then they also have annual ones that you pay annually um, where you are going to get a bigger discount by by committing to it annually and then also prepaying for it annually as well. And that initiative is called New Commerce Experience. So if you hear you know, Troy T or um, the web or news or anybody else talk about Microsoft New Commerce Experience, that's what that's all about. So good question, Randy. In this case, these prices are the legacy prices. <clears throat> um, so Microsoft Business Basic, again, this is the, the um, web versions of these. And then um, we won't talk about apps for business. Um, we'll talk about business standard though. So business standard includes the desktop versions of these. And then also they have a subscription that's called business premium. And business premium is what we'll probably spend most of our time talking about. Business premium is um, not all the way to the full M365 enterprise subscriptions, but it includes those advanced features related to like conditional access and security, um, information protection, those kind of things that aren't part of just business standard. And business premium is really the sweet spot, in my opinion, of licensing for Office 365 um, because, again, of how much that you get. You get a, a ton of features in business premium. And you can certainly get business standard and then add on the additional licenses that you need, for example, for Azure Active Directory, uh, one of the premium plans there, or Intune, um, for example. Um, but then you quickly eclipse the cost of business premium. So the cost of buying standard with the additional add-ons that you want to increase your security and compliance and things like that, uh, that quickly gets to be more expensive than just buying a business premium license. So that's why business premium is really the sweet spot in my opinion. And we will look more, like I said, at business premium. Okay, so then there's some other plans that are uh, the Microsoft 365 Enterprise plans. Um, so these have stayed Microsoft 365 or sometimes called M365 um, plans since they were uh, created. So they have not been renamed. Um, and they they really are, um, they include what Office 365 includes, but then they include um, substantially more, obviously depending on which plan that you pick, E3 versus E5. Um, so if we switch over and look at the pricing for those, um, they are significantly more expensive. Uh, so just as an example, you know, business premium was $20 a month and then Microsoft 365 business standard is $12.50. So when we switch over here and we look at what the enterprise plans cost, uh, like I said, you can see that there's a pretty substantial jump there. Uh, we'll, we'll spend our time talking about E3 and E5 today. We won't uh, cover F5, F3 there. Um, so you can see $32 per user versus only $20 for business premium or only $12.50 for business standard or all the way up to $57 per user for Microsoft E5. Um, so one, then one of the questions obviously is going to be, you know, why are these so much more? Um, what would we get out of these versus one of the business plans? So um, fundamentally, there's one major difference, and that is the number of users that are allowed. So in one of the Microsoft business plans, um, 
Microsoft 365 business, uh, so like business standard or business premium, for example, they're limited to a maximum of 300 users. So that's one major criteria there. If your organization is over 300 users, uh, you can't buy uh, or you can't use uh, one of the Microsoft 365 business licenses. You have to go with one of the enterprise ones. Now, that being said, if you're 300 or under, you can buy either one. Um, so then it comes down to the features that you want to have and the capabilities, you know, and, and what the value is of that. So um, the, the standard pieces are included, for example, in uh, Office 365, or excuse me, the standard Office 365 features are included in the enterprise ones like they are in the Microsoft 365 business ones. Um, one difference, for example, is when we get to Teams, the Microsoft E5 version, Microsoft 365 E5, it includes Teams Voice. Um, and what that is, is that's the ability to use Microsoft Teams to make and receive traditional phone system phone calls. So, so Microsoft that, that replaces Teams can... their phone, existing phone bill, right, Wes? Whatever they're paying it, right. for their, their, their VoIP system or whether they're paying the traditional landline, that goes away because they're using Microsoft's uh, voice over IP phone system. Correct. Yep, that is absolutely correct. So um, <clears throat> Microsoft um, Teams with the voice option enables you to receive or place calls and you can transfer calls between staff. Um, it's got voicemail, it's got auto attendance, um, holiday hours, um, call queues, like, you know, the features that you would expect in traditional phone systems, um, all built into the Teams platform. So it's a really nice way to have integrated communications. So you don't have to run a phone or phone system and a separate instant message communication system like Teams all integrated in one. And then you have the advantage of presence information too. So if I'm in a meeting, Teams will show that I'm in that meeting. And if someone goes to transfer a call to me, they're not necessarily going to go look in Teams first um, and see if I'm available or not um, if they just have a traditional phone system. But if they're using Teams as their phone system, when they go to transfer, they'd be doing it through Teams. So they would see right away that I'm already in a meeting. I'm not going to be able to take that call, for example. So that and it integrated presence. Specifies, is, I'm sorry, Wes, I keep interrupting you. Oh. It actually specifies whether you're in a meeting or on the phone. Um, so like right. sometimes you're in a meeting, you're you're meeting with somebody face to face because you're not actually on a phone call. So that's one of the things that I like when I see it is I can actually tell whether they're on the on the phone or connected to a call. Absolutely, right? Um, there are multiple statuses. So in a call is one, for example, in a meeting is another. There's also, you know, do not disturb and away from keyboard, uh, away from, you know, away from your computer, um, that kind of stuff too. Uh, um, so that's, it's very handy to have all of that in one place. Very, very, very handy. And, and you can do this from anywhere. I can take my laptop and go to a hotel in California and just connect to uh, internet and I can make calls and see and be connected to my work for my coworkers, you know, right. everybody in the network. That's exactly right. Transfer calls to and from, uh, receive calls. And it's it's not dependent on you being in the office, being physically present. You can put the application on your mobile device, for, for example, and then you can use it from anywhere. You can install the application on your laptop, same thing, and be mobile. Um, so that part is really handy. Enables you to be, you know, connected, as connected as you want to be, um, from anywhere that you that you want to be. Um, and that's a really good enablement for remote workers, for example, because if they're working from home, but they're not able to place or receive phone calls from home, uh, you know, are they as connected? Are they as efficient or effective when they're working from home like that? Um, not necessarily, right? Um, and so this is a, a nice way to have them be connected and you don't have to go out, you know, and, and spend a lot of money on additional hardware or things like that to connect them or upgrade a legacy phone system. Uh, to enable remote external users or voice over IP and that kind of thing. Um, it's all built right into Teams. a lot more secure too. A lot more secure than the traditional means of remoting in. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's correct, yep. Um, and, Eli uh, has a question. If you make a call, what number shows up on the other end? That's a great question, Eli. Thank you for the questions. I love that. Um, so you can port your numbers over to Teams and so oh, Matthew it, it will function. You. Matthew said each user is assigned a phone number. Yes. He's familiar um, with. So a couple different ways to handle it. 
Yep, so each user gets assigned a phone number and um, that phone number can be their actual phone number. So it can be what shows up when they call out or it can be used as the virtual phone number, the routing phone number, um, and you can specify what you want the caller ID to show up as. So we use this team's voice ourselves here at TriT, for example. Um, and when we call out our technicians, we don't want um, their individual phone numbers to show up because we don't want our clients to be confused by seeing all kinds of different phone numbers depending on who's calling them. So we have it configured that one. No matter who's calling out, it shows the true IT main number. That way the client's caller ID, you know, they recognize who it is. And if they try to call back, they're calling in through the right proper channels and calling you know, into our main line versus calling some, you know, somebody's individual line who may or may not be available or be at their desk at that time. So it's very flexible, uh, it's, it's, it's very cool. It supports uh, toll-free numbers, um, you know, long distance, all the, again, all the things that you would expect as part of your phone system. Love the questions, thank you. So um, another piece that's included here is uh, this device and app management. So um, this is one of the terms that Microsoft uses for uh, the capabilities of what they call Intune. So we'll talk more about Intune a little bit later here. Um, but that's, for example, this capability is not part of the Microsoft Business M365 plans, um, except for premium, um, whereas it is part of enterprise, for example. Um, a couple other things um, down here, for example, that's included when we get down far enough. So uh, um, analytics, so the E5 plan includes Power BI Pro, whereas the E3 plan doesn't, and none of the business uh, Microsoft 365 business plans include Power BI, for example. So that's another difference. Um, this identity and access management. So we'll talk more about this too in just a little bit. Um, this is the capability to do to um, integrate your local domain Active Directory to a cloud Azure Active Directory, and then allow um, single sign-on and password sync. Um, uh, there's much more to it, and, and we'll circle back to it. I don't want to say too much now because we'll come back to it. So, so another piece is this Azure Information Protection. Um, so this is the ability to mark uh, documents, information um, to the, their sensitivity, how you know private or how sensitive that information is, and then control who can see that information or where who it can be sent to based on policies related, um, related to that sensitivity, for example, that's in there. Um, and then another piece here for, for compliance management, so compliance of devices, um, compliance of data, and so on. So we'll talk a little bit about those too. All right. So then last plans that we'll just cover real briefly here is the, the ones that are still Office 365. And so these plans um, are, again, they, they have not really deviated. They're, they've been around for a long time. These are the Office 365 enterprise plans. So these, again, are, are meant for larger organizations. Um, if you're over 300 users, you have to buy an enterprise Office 365 versus, again, buying any of those, those Microsoft uh, 365 business plans. Um, so that's one of the differences between them as well. Um, so they've been around for a long time. They're, they're not going anywhere, um, but they are different than the Microsoft um, Business 365 plans. So the main ones that we'll look at here real quick is E1, E3, and E5. And um, E1, so includes email, includes file storage, sharing meetings, so on. This again does not include the desktop applications. Um, so this is a very uh, low cost, lightweight way to enable your staff, to, for example, to have access to a company email and a company OneDrive. Whoops, excuse me, didn't mean to advance the slide. Um, and a company OneDrive um, without necessarily having to pay for all of that, the, the rest of the applications if they're not going to use them. So if they're, for example, um, working in a factory or uh, working as a um, you know cashier, um, retail sales, you know, some of those kind of uh, roles, they're not necessarily at a computer all day. They don't need to boot up Excel and do complex spreadsheets. Um, they just need basic email, the ability to communicate on Teams, you know, and store some files kind of thing. And they can do that through a web interface. So that's, what, that's the lowest cost entry. E3 includes um, all the E1 features, including the desktop applications, um, and then some security and compliance capabilities as well. And E5 obviously is everything in E3 plus more advanced security analytics and that um, same voice capability as um, Microsoft M365 E5. So it includes the team's voice availability in there too. 
So if we look at those just real quick, um, you see again how complex sometimes this stuff gets because Microsoft not only has all of these license plans, but they have different uh, pages, different sections of their site dedicated to these um, because it's hard to show them all in just one big massive grid. You can again see the pricing here. So $8 um, for that E1 plan all the way up to $35 for the E5 plan. So the E5 plan again um, is like Office 365 uh, or includes Office 365, but like the M365 plan, it includes Teams Voice, for example, as one of the capabilities in here. It does not include all of this other advanced um, like um, Azure, um, in Azure Active Directory and some of those kind of things. It doesn't include everything that M365 includes, because obviously there's a difference between M365 and Office 365. So, okay, so let's look a little bit more at the specifics. So um, <clears throat> one of the capabilities that's included in the M365 plans and in the Windows, or excuse me, in the Microsoft 365 Business Premium is this idea of Microsoft Intune. And so what Intune is, is it's a mobile application management and mobile device management tool. And how this works is devices are enrolled in this service. So basically uh, connect to the, the service in the cloud and they establish that they have a relationship with your business, right? And that can be done, it's done usually through their um, Office 365 login. So they, they log in, um, they connect, and then a policy applies to that device. And the policies, as you can see up here, um, they can apply to the IT managed devices, so company provided devices, but we can also apply these devices to the bring your own device, the employee's own personal cell phone, for example, or personal tablet or laptop. Um, and that's a really powerful capability. And one of the things that we might do with this is we can use Intune for a, a whole range of capabilities here. One of the things that it can do is that it can manage applications. So for your users, um, you can enforce that they have to have certain applications installed on their device um, in order for them to, to work, right? Um, one of the things that you might want to enforce is that they have antivirus installed, or you might want to be able to enforce that they have the Office 365 desktop applications installed. And you can do that through Intune, and then the user is, is hands off and IT is hands off because Intune takes care of that. It pushes those applications out to the device. Um, another capability that has though is, uh, for example, on users' devices, um, so ones that aren't owned by the corporation, um, for those devices, we may wanna just have policies that say, for example, um, they're not allowed to download company data to that mobile device. And so um, we can block them from accessing any company data unless they've connected, registered with Intune, and then that establishes them as a, a staff, a personal device. And then once Intune knows that they're a personal device, it could block um, them having access to or storing certain uh, company information, for example. So we may have stuff that's public and we're fine with them looking at that on their mobile device or even downloading it, but we have, may have stuff that we don't want to be public and we don't want that to go on anybody's personal devices. Um, additionally, we can do things like remotely wipe the data from that personal device if we unenroll them from Intune, meaning if that user is terminated, now we could pull off any of the company files that we allowed on the device in the first place. And we can take that all the way up to uh, deleting the company email, for example, off of that device. So uh, it's very common for companies, businesses, and organizations to allow their staff to set up their company email on their personal device. Um, it's convenient, allows them to check it you know, at all times and work, for, again, very seamlessly from anywhere. However, if that employee is terminated, do we necessarily want all that information residing on their device, right? So it's a really nice capability to be able to wipe that remotely in the event that an employee leaves. Um, likewise for lost devices. So this, this could apply again to laptops or um, you know, phones and iPads, for example. Um, and this could be whether it's a company device or whether it's an employee device, we may wanna have a policy on it that says, if this is lost, I wanna be able to delete all of that data and make sure that um, if that device, you know, falls into someone else's hands, um, that they can't just simply, you know, boot it up, crack a password like I did uh, when I when I helped Randy, um, and then now all of a sudden have access to all of that data. So that's another really very powerful capability of the uh, Windows Intune. So again, this is available with Microsoft 365, the M365, excuse me, and it's available as part of uh, Microsoft M365 Business, the one that's for 300 users or less, 
the premium version of that. Um, just a quick diagram. I know this is there's a lot in here, so we're not going to dig into it um, very deep, but just to show all of the pieces and parts um, that work together as part of this Intune. And this goes back to this idea that all of the Microsoft 365, M365 platform is integrated. So if you try to do something like this without using the Microsoft tools, you'd have one system for authentication. So usernames, passwords, it's, you'd have another system for mobile device management, and you'd have at least a third system for data management, um, um, ensuring that you know data loss protection, um, ensuring that you can do um, policies on you know various tagged kind kind of sensitivity levels of the data and things like that. Um, and there's even more to this that again I won't go through every piece of this diagram, but lots lots of stuff there. So another piece that's part again of, of business premium and also is available in the enterprise, the M365 plans is Windows Defender. Um, so Windows Defender is an integrated threat protection uh, capability that's that Microsoft provides. Um, it's primarily geared to protect Office 365, um, especially around email, for example, um, email threats and phishing, credential phishing, um, that kind of thing. Um, again, it's a very integrated piece of all of this. And it also has the capability of aggregating the threat assessment across the devices for the enterprise. And so I'll switch back to the diagram here quick. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's taking the information that it's seeing. So if there's a phishing attack that's um, you know attacking a specific user, for example, um, that's not necessarily as easy to detect if it's just you know one person out of many. But if there becomes multiple people that are being attacked, uh, the system will recognize the fact that there's lots of attacks going on. Um, it will it will even apply artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning kind of tactics to correlate those together and say if if it looks like there's a connection between these attacks, like what is going on here, um, and why are we seeing you know all of these different kind of attacks uh, attacking multiple um, people within our organization. Um, and then there's a little bit of capabilities in there for to help with like you know security posture, threat mitigation, that kind of stuff as well. Um, that's part of this. Next piece I'll talk about here. Um, again, all, all these pieces I'm talking about now are parts that are are pieces that are part of business premium, and they're part of the M365 uh, enterprise plans, the E3 and E5 plans. So another piece is called Azure Information uh, Protection, and this um, what this is for is uh, um, this is the part that secures that information so that it doesn't share it outside of your organization. Um, it can, in, in, can secure emails, um, documents, for example, files, and it does it through a couple different methods. Um, there's a very easy classification tool that's available when you have this uh, license for this, and it enables you to uh, easily classify individual files, folders, and so on um, to say that you know everything in this is, you know, low sensitivity, basically essentially public versus medium sensitivity versus highly sensitive, you know, very, very confidential kinds of information. And then you can apply policies based on that, again, related to is this allowed to be shared outside the organization? If I were to take a piece of information that's tagged as highly sensitive and attach it to an email and try to send it to someone outside the organization, the Azure Information Protection Service would catch that and, and would block that. It would not allow that email to go out. If I were to send it to multiple people, some in the organization, some out, <clears throat> now it can take a deeper look at that and say, it's okay to send this within your organization, but more specifically, it's okay to send it to this and this and this person, but it's not okay to send it to anybody that's you know not part of our accounting team, finance team, for example, outside of HR or something like that. Um, so it can get very specific on who's allowed to see the information um, and then what levels of information they're allowed to see. And it, we tie that all back to our master list of users <clears throat> and groups, um, and so we can again we can uh, we can manage this based on the the group or the role of that individual and the sensitivity of the information itself. So that's also a very cool feature. Uh, this is just a quick look at the Azure Information Protection dashboard, and um, this is just a sample. Uh, image obviously, um, just showing some of the capabilities that are in there. Um, it's going to tell us at a glance again if it's seeing things um, that it feels are suspicious. It can tell us if there are uh, areas, um, documents that haven't been uh, tagged or uh, evaluated, right? Haven't been marked to their security sensitivity, um, and then it can tell you, you know, how many uh, attempts there have been 
can you, you can even drill into the level and see who has attempted to send information um, in a way that was blocked by Azure Information Protection. So very, very cool, very powerful tool there as well. Um, next piece that we'll talk about is called Azure uh, Active Directory. And so um, people who've been around IT or Windows or Microsoft for, uh, for fairly long have heard this idea of Active Directory. And Active Directory is Microsoft's uh, unified centralized user management tool. Um, it's an identity tool or identity management. Um, it also does author authorization and authentication. Um, so it says you know, who, who they are, proves who they are when they log in. And then that ties into their group or their role that we use in order to set permissions for them. Um, so it, it, it does a lot of that, um, again, managing users, managing security, that kind of thing uh, within an organization. So Microsoft has a capability that's called Azure Active Directory, which is similar to the, the on-premise Active Directory that we've talked about before in the sense that it's got users. Um, we can assign groups and roles and things like that, um, but it's a cloud service. <clears throat> now, again, in, in Microsoft fashion, um, because they do so many different things, they also have a cloud Active Directory. So you can get an Azure version of Active Directory that's the same as your on-premise, but it's done as a service in Azure. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here um, is what's called Azure Active Directory. <clears throat> and Azure Active Directory, um, essentially, it's it's boiled around giving us a, a kind of like three core, if you will, capabilities here, which is uh, one is single sign-on. So whether they log into their local computer and their local copy of Outlook and so on, um, or whether they're logging into their Outlook um, web or their Office 365 web applications, um, Teams, OneDrive, those kind of things. Um, it's it's the same username and password, and so we can say if they change their password, whether they change it, you know, in the cloud or they change it on their local machine, it will synchronize that information, and so the users don't have to remember multiple passwords. The passwords don't get out of sync, cuts down on support, makes it seamless for users. Um, so it's very very again easy, simple, um, saves them a lot of time. Another piece that's really important is multi-factor authentication. So this is the capability when you go to log in, for example, you have to uh, apply a code, maybe you type it off of your phone, or maybe you have an authenticator app that you approve. Um, there's other ways to do multi-factor authentication as well, um, but that's part of this. And then this piece called conditional access. And so conditional access, access goes hand in hand with Windows Intune and says um, the users uh, are prevented from doing certain things, for example, accessing data on the network, unless they meet these certain rules. So it could be, for example, that they have to have um, all the security patches from Microsoft applied on their device. If they don't, if they're using an insecure device, we're not going to allow them to access our data on the network or our data in the cloud until they resolve those problems. For example, um, so it's a it's very cool. Um, it's it's a very very like core foundational fundamental piece taking your your on-premise IT and connecting it to this M365 or business premium um, services in the cloud, for example. <clears throat> so I'll give you just a quick screenshot of kind of how all that stuff ties together. Again, I won't go deep dive into this diagram. Um, we don't have time for that, but there is a lot to this piece as well. Um, it's very, very useful, um, very powerful capability there too. So um, <clears throat> that's very high level. Uh, talking about some of those core pieces. And again, we didn't dive uh, into every capability of M365. We looked at some of the core fundamental pieces that are part of the M365 subscriptions that are also part of Business Premium. So if you if you have an interest in those, um, you know, know that you can get them either way. One of the next things that I want to just show here quick, because um, this is kind of the last piece, is And whoops, one second, sorry about that. To switch my screen sharing here. <clears throat> so for Microsoft M 365. Why is it still showing the wrong thing? I apologize, I'm not sure.
Sorry for this delay. Okay, there we go. So these are um, some of the enterprise licenses, and I realize this is a super tiny font, <clears throat> um, and we're and we're not going to uh, dig into this in detail. So I'm not expecting you to read this, but this is just to show you, for example, the complexity of the Microsoft licensing. So here we've got the Microsoft M365 E licenses, so E3 and E5, for example, <clears throat> um, compared to the Office 365 E licenses that we talked about, and then enterprise mobility and security add-ons, Windows 11. Uh, this is Windows 11 um, enterprise licenses, for example, and then the 365. These are again are, are some of the um, other uh, subscription types here. So like the frontline worker ones um, for Office 365 and Microsoft 365. So this is a, a PDF that Microsoft makes available that shows what's included and what's not included in the different licensing um, SKUs. And it's nine pages long. So just as an example of how complicated this is, again, this is why I'm not going to go through every single bullet point on here. Um, <clears throat> and again, Microsoft also enables us to purchase um, a lower kind of license, like maybe an E3, and then add on some of the other capabilities to it. Um, so there's a, essentially a matrix of licensing that you can do, and it's, it can be very, again, very complicated. All right, so last thing I want to leave you with here is um, this is a little bit more intuitive to show you how the pieces tie together. Um, it's, a, it's a slightly out of date um, PDF um, because it still talks about Windows 10 instead of Windows 11. But for example, Office 365, um, this is just comparing the enterprise version. So this is what's included in Office 365 E3. But then if you go to Microsoft M365 E3, it's all of that Office, all of this um, enterprise mobility um, and security capabilities and then which is into an Azure uh, information protection, Azure Active Directory, you know, again, those pieces that we looked at um, and more. And then also the Windows 10 E3, E3 um, perpetual licensing. So the Windows forever. Again, this is now Windows 11 instead of Windows 10. And then we can see that we can expand that. Um, if we go up to Microsoft uh, 365 E5, it's all of that plus all of this other um, stuff here. So um, won't bore you with all of of the details of all the various um, different license SKUs and how they can work together, um, but this is just one example of a, a matrix that shows how the you know how the pieces can be fit together, and how they're bundled up um, when you go from a lower subscription like M365 E3 to E5. Okay, so with that, <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing my screen. The easiest way to uh, talk to me, and then I can. Uh, get you connected with different uh, aspects of True IT. Um, just if you just go to uh, trueit.com and schedule your one on one, it actually will show uh, times that I'm available for a brief chat. It, it, it blocks off 30 minutes, but most of the time it's more like 15 minutes. But uh, or you can call my direct line. That's right there. 701-356-3021 or email me at randy.philippi at trueit.com. Just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today and we appreciate your valuable time and I hope this was informative and useful information to you. And, and, and like Rand said, if you do have any questions um, for anything that we didn't cover here um, or like to do any kind of a deeper dive with any of this, reach out to Randy. He'd be happy to get something set up for you. Thanks.